The coldest? When freeloading just isn't hitting the spot anymore, 9 out of 10 doctors recommend Patreon. Benefits include early access to new videos, plus exclusive bonuses to scratch that itch while you're waiting for the next big drop. Mmm, satisfying. <laughs> while there are an array of qualities that may bring any crime or criminal into the public spotlight, there are very few things more prone to capture the public's imagination than a cold case. You might want to ascribe something noble to the attraction that many people seem to have with real-life murder mysteries. A yearning to see victims' lives honoured and perpetrators brought to justice, for instance. But a more realistic, if not somewhat cynical explanation is that people just really love to know how a story ends. And when they're deprived of that, it drives them crazy. Today's story was one without an ending for the longest time, so long that when it was finally resolved in 2012, it was labelled in the press as the oldest solved cold case in American history. Really? It starts on a snowy December evening in 1957 in the small town of Sycamore, Illinois, when a little girl named Maria Ridolph is oh, let out no. to play with her friend Kathy Sigmund. The girls are playing on the street near Maria's house when around 6.30 p.m. they are approached by a young man wearing a colourful sweater. He was no! about average height, not a man. Hair, a gap in his teeth, and went by the name Johnny. After introducing himself, Johnny asked if the girls liked dolls and piggyback rides. All of this is based off of Kathy Sigmund's account. She ran into her Oops. house to grab mittens while Johnny was giving Maria a piggyback ride. No! And that was the last time that anyone saw Maria Ridolph alive. No! The abduction of Maria Ridolph devastated the town of Sycamore and gained national attention, to the point that even FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was asking for personal daily updates on the seven-year-old's disappearance. But in spite of an intense search and investigative effort, it seemed as if Maria Ridolph and the nefarious young man who called himself Johnny had disappeared into thin air. Until about five months later, on April 26, 1958, when a couple that were hunting for mushrooms in a wooded area over 100 miles from Sycamore stumbled across a small, decomposed body, <gasps> a body that would soon be confirmed as that of Maria Ridolph. <laughs> the worst was now confirmed, and while losing a child in such a horrific manner could be said to be the worst thing a parent could possibly imagine going through, the one thing that could make such an ordeal even more tormenting still is having to live with the knowledge that the monster responsible for taking your baby's life and innocence is still out there. Yeah. That is a burden that the parents of Maria Rudolph would take to their graves, no! as the authorities of the time and in the decades that followed would fail to apprehend the man who had taken their daughter. But that wasn't for a lack of trying. As stated, the investigation was intense and bolstered further by nationwide intrigue. In the days following her abduction, the police and FBI investigated hundreds of potential suspects, all of whom were cleared. One door they knocked on during that period was the Tessier residence on 227 Centre Cross Street, only a few doors down from where Maria was taken. The person of interest in the Tessier family certainly seemed to fit the bill. 18-year-old John Tessier, known to friends as Johnny, stood at 5 foot 11 inches tall, had blonde hair, and even a gap in his front teeth. Oh. Here but we supposedly, go. logistics did not allow him to be the culprit. According to John Tessier's sisters, when police questioned his mother Eileen, she assured them that John was home all night. Besides that, the boy had no sort of history that would seem to be in line with that of a child abductor, and he was well known in the neighborhood where the episode had taken place. FBI agents took John Tessier off their suspect list after he passed a lie detector on the matter on December 10th. The very next day, he left home to join the military. And that was the last time that John Tessier's name was ever really spoken in the same breath as Maria Rudolph's. That is until 36 years later, 36? in 1994, when Eileen Tessier 
was lying on her deathbed. Eileen called out to her daughter and John Tessier's half-sister, Janet. According to Janet Tessier, Eileen confided in her the following words. Those two little girls and the one that disappeared. John did it. John (gasps) did it. And you have have to tell tell someone. someone. And Janet did tell someone. Yet it would still be a long time before the case was actually reopened. In the years that followed, Janet Tessier made numerous attempts to bring her mother's words to the attention of someone that might have the power to do something. But every time, she was dismissed. This was in spite of the fact that she had more to offer than just the words of an elderly woman days from death's door. Though Janet was not old enough at the time of Maria's abduction to remember the event in her adult years, John's other two half-sisters, Jean and Catherine, were. They remembered hearing their mother tell the police that John was home all night, and the reason they remembered it so vividly was because they knew at the time it wasn't true. Truth be told, they had never been able to shake a suspicion that John was responsible, and their mother's dying words confirmed what had nagged at them for all those years. But when Janet contacted Sycamore Police several times over a number of years by her account, the answer was always the same. John Tessier had been investigated and cleared at the time. The alleged words of a dying woman were not enough to bring charges, and the 36-year-old memories of her two daughters didn't do much to improve things. The Rudolph case remained as cold as could be. So cold. But finally, on September 11th of 2008, Janet Tessier sent an email to Illinois State Police, and for whatever reason, this time, something about what she was saying resonated with someone on the receiving end. That person was State Police Commander Tony Rapaz. He decided there was enough to her story to put two star investigators, Larry Cott and Brian Hanley, on the case. And they uncovered quite a bit about John Tessier's past to suggest that this well could be a strong lead after all. First of all, he fit the bill of a child abductor much more clearly than when authorities first glanced at him when he was only 18 years old. His sister Jean alleged that he had molested her and other girls in the neighborhood when she was growing up. And Jean Tessier was not the only person investigators spoke to that could attest to John having sexual interest in young girls, including those in his own family. When they spoke to one of his ex-wives, Denise Trexler, she told them that she had discovered a naked photo of his 12-year-old daughter from another marriage taped to the bottom of a drawer in their house. The girl's name was Christine Marie Tessier. At the age of 34, she went missing before showing up dead about a month later, next to a drainage ditch on a local golf course. She was apparently last seen with her boyfriend, but no one has ever been charged with her murder. What? Investigators also came across a woman named Pamela Long, who had a particularly striking story to tell, given the circumstances of Maria's disappearance. Pamela grew up in the same neighborhood, and when she was around Maria's age, an older boy offered her a piggyback ride, which she accepted. Pamela's father, who was nearby, saw what was going on, and immediately deemed it to be completely inappropriate. He ran over, pulled Pamela off of the boy's back, Mm -hmm. and strongly warned the teen not to approach his daughter again. Mm -hmm. The boy was known to the rest of the neighborhood to be strange, and the boy was John Tessier. There was no doubt about it. He's clearly the culprit. John Tessier had changed his name in the early 90s to Jack McCullough, taking his mother's maiden name and simply preferring Jack. And he now lived in Seattle, Washington. (gasps) On June 29th of 2011, based on the discoveries we've just been over and more that we'll get into shortly, McCullough was brought in to Seattle Police Headquarters for questioning in relation to the disappearance of Maria Rudolph. We've not been formally introduced. I'm Dave Zolaski. Dave, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, Brian? Brian, Brian. Oh, um, here we go. I'm an investigator and and Brian's with... Disgusting pedophile. um, State Police. And uh, with who? Illinois State Police. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, he got away you with it for so long. A long time ago, um, back fifty years ago. Um, fifty years. A young girl was abducted. Who? I wrote. I yeah. I called that in. I called the FBI about that. Huh? Back back in uh, 
December 3rd, 1957. Maria. Maria, exactly. Yes. And um, we've been going through and doing some, some new interviewing and new investigations regarding that. Yeah, I'll be glad to help with that. And, um, Background information. And you've been divorced three times? It, are, okay. You're investigating the child, right? You're not investigating me. Right. Uh, th this is a personal history form. All right. We, we fill this out for, for every, everybody. Right. Our, our right. command yeah. wants, wants yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just do what I'm told, yeah. you know? <laughs> you know why I said you weren't, you weren't from here? Why is that? You got a tan. Oh, huh? yeah. <laughs> and there's a, there's a joke. What do you call somebody in Seattle with a tan? Stranger. <laughs> <laughs> One interesting quality of Jack McCullough's interrogation is that he will veer back and forth between completely cooperative and hostile or borderline hostile repeatedly. For what it's worth, he was brought into the room in cuffs, so he is likely not in two minds about whether or not he is under suspicion. Uh -huh. If you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed uh -huh. to you free of cost before questioning if you wish. And you understand that. That's all good advice. I'm on your side on this. Okay. I'm trying to help you. Right. I, I mean, I, like I said, we just uh, yeah, right, right, got to right. follow the boss's rules. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Because if the forms ain't filled out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. When are you going to get get to the good part now? We, we are. We are done with my okay part. <laughs> I I had um, I had a dream, and and then it reminded me of a conversation I had as a kid. There's a little grade school that's only a block away from my home in Sycamore, which is 226. Oh, you want to oh, write that Oh, here down? we go. The address in Sycamore? Who okay. asked? 227 Center Cross Street. I, I, was, talking, I was talking to a, a kid, and he said, you see that guy over there? I was... Uh, this guy's I was sick. 17, 18, 17. Anyway, and he said, he said, stay away from that kid. He, he, he wants to talk about sex. Okay, so I this 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 kid out now. I'm gonna to have to reach back and remember his name. I I think I I wrote it to the FBI. But I, um, I, it bothered me enough where I I called up, and he lived with with uh, two two boys named Davies. Uh, Don Davies is one of them, and I don't remember the other one. But he was he was a He was a kid they allowed to stay with them. He didn't have a, a home in, in Sycamore. So he's like a foster kid kind of a thing? And on the same block as Maria lived. It can't be said for sure whether or not McCullough's story of tipping the FBI off to a boy who was said to like talking about sex and lived on the same block as Maria some 50 odd years after the fact when the memory miraculously came back to him in a dream is true. But no records from the FBI confirming this communication have ever come to light. He's lying. The investigators continue to question time. about his family background and then bring him back to the day of December 3rd, 1957. Now, I want to I want to go back to um, the you know, and, and this to me is kind of a a thing. You know, it's kind of like you know we all remember where we were when President Kennedy was shot or. 9 11 happened, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. and this is kind of the 9 11 for Sycamore. I mean, yeah, okay. anybody who we've talked to who's. This is gonna, you're going to like this. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me, tell me kind of what you remember about that. Um, the day Maria was kidnapped, I was in the induction center in Chicago joining the Air Force. I spent the entire day there. And they have a record day of the there. five minutes. Not the whole day. I was really pissed. The FBI day. even talked to me back then as, Night. A, as a suspect. And, uh, and they even interrogated me. And um, it's because the suspect that they think took Maria had a green coat. It was described and as I a colorful a sweater, not a green coat. At the time. So... You know, I'm sure they asked the neighbors, you know, anybody with a green jacket. Yeah, Jack's got one. He's trying so hard to so pass the blame right now. You, so how did you wind up at the induction center? Let's. I don't know how I got there. I, I may have taken the train. 
but um, I was there um, most of the day. And um, uh, you have again, you 50 test, years to be, come they, up with an alibi. And uh, I was disappointed in them, really, really disappointed because I had an ironclad alibi of where I was. Uh huh. And uh -huh. they didn't even check. Didn't even make a phone call. I was very disappointed. Well, let's let's go back and and kind of walk me through because um, they said you you. Bro, I can't wear this hat anymore. Let's go to the day before. It's driving were, my ears crazy. Going downtown or something. Um, tell me as much as you can. And then I gotta take it off. About, I'm gonna have to live with my my oh, you head hat hair. Yeah. How did you get downtown? See, I don't remember. I mean, we're, we're talking about many years ago. Um, I know no family member was with me, so... Grab a brush. No, it's going to be flat. Here, so I must it's going to be flat because I had a hat on. I don't know. Now, did you have to purchase your own ticket? Did they give you a ticket? I don't know. Just don't remember it all. Is it important? Yes, very, and more on this. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that we're talking about, you know. No, you look at me as a suspect, and I don't like this. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, as I told you, there's been some discrepancies in, you know, interviews that we're having, and that's why I'm trying to find out what happened on the day and where you were on the day she disappeared. I already told you. Well, but I, I spent wanted... the entire day in Chicago that day. McCullough's proposed alibi is that his activities around being enlisted into the military would have excluded him from being able to abduct Maria Rodolph in Sycamore at the time that she went missing. One part of his story is that on December 2nd, he travelled from the town of Rockford where the military induction centre was located to Chicago for a medical examination, and he had to stay overnight in Chicago for another examination in the morning on December 3rd, after which he did some sightseeing during the day. Note again that Maria was abducted in the early evening of December 3rd, mm -hmm. sometime between 6.30 and 7 p.m. Yeah, when you, got back to, when you got back in the evening, what did you do? Mm -hmm. This was a big day. I mean, it, this is a day that... That probably crashed because it was a hard day. So you, you think you were home asleep? I'm assuming. You're assuming? So why, why would people say you weren't there? Who, what people? Your sisters? They don't know. Well, they don't know. They say they do. They don't know where where I, where I was back then. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. No. Yes. When we start to to look at at the story that you tell here, okay, we've done a lot of interviews. There's things that just um, aren't are right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, First of all, you had the nickname Johnny, I think. Yeah. Okay. So the person that was introduced themselves to the girls said he was Johnny. Okay. Who knows? Okay. Um, the description of His arms the are person, crossed because he's uncomfortable. Um, matches you down to the, the gap in the teeth. Yeah. He's in his defensive that's, state. Well, really was surprising. Yeah, well, I'm sure, but you know, that's, that's what they, height, the weight. The, See, but I, that was my neighborhood. Everybody knew me. So if they, if they had seen me on the street, Maria's parents knew me. I used <gasps> to play with their, their, their daughters in the backyard. You sicko. See, that's, you know. Um, yeah, that makes you well, more guilty. The, uh, the description isn't coming from Maria. Though. It's coming no, she from, was, from, she from was Kathy. kidnapped. Right. Was coming from Kathy, the other girl that was there. So she she described somebody who looked remarkably like you mm -hmm. and had the gap in the teeth, the gap same in color the teeth. hair. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, see, I didn't hear anything about these descriptions. Changed your name the thing conveniently. I heard was mm -hmm. he had a, a green jacket? Well, actually, it was a it was a sweater that, that was the description. All right, I don't have a and green sweater. Had, I had a jacket. Well, and it wasn't a green sweater. It was a multicolored sweater. He just yeah. ratted himself yeah. out. Yeah. Well, and but your your family says that you had a multicolored sweater that was just 
the same description. Mm -hmm. And that after Maria disappears, that sweater disappears. Oh, this is bullshit. No, it's not. You also told the FBI um, that you had some sex play with your sister. Oh, my God. I took, I took a lie detector test. I, we're talking about, about what you said. Yeah, did, right. Did you have sex and, with your sister? And they, and they, and they said, and, 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 he's, and he, he said, uh -huh. what? when was this? I said, when we were little. Okay. Now, your sister says that it wasn't just when you were little. So? Well, so what I'm pointing out here is that he just said if you so. say you told them the, F, the FBI the truth, yeah. and you were little, and yet at the same time you're having sex with, with your sister. I am not having sex with my sisters. The indignation Paula suddenly displays at the suggestion he had sex with his stepsisters speaks to how warped his conception of the parameters of normal behavior seems to be. Mm -hmm. In this exchange, it appears as if McCullough is trying to qualify that he only engaged in some sort of limited sex play with his siblings as opposed to full intercourse mm -hmm. and that it only happened when he was also very young which given the age gap doesn't actually do much if anything to make the idea any less disturbing. Putting that aside, any remotely well-adjusted person understands that incestuous activity of any kind is extremely noxious and should be expected to express severe offence at the notion they've ever engaged in anything like it. I'm just telling you what not just one but multiple sisters have said. Right. Okay. Um, they, they also say, well, actually, um, Dave Frederick, says that he saw your car driving in the late afternoon in Sycamore. So? A good rule of thumb to keep in mind with Jack McCullough is that whenever he says the word so, it is yeah. almost certainly in response to a damning piece of information. The significance of McCullough's car being spotted driving through the neighborhood at a time he claims he couldn't have been there is self-explanatory, uh -huh. and it's highly doubtful he's as oblivious to this as he's letting on. Yeah, I can't believe he's answering said, with so. Um, the, to uh, Janet and Mary, that you killed her, Maria. This is a lie. This is a lie. My mother loved me to death. I know she did. And I she, know she did, and she. And, and she was crying when the FBI wanted to talk to me. I, I have no doubt because she also she also told them some, some lies to the FBI. My mother doesn't lie. Well, okay, if she said, said why is he ombre right? help? And the girls sat right there and said, he couldn't. It does look like he has poor looked, blood circulation or something because he is like right up top and like us. pale Holding on the bottom. The and your mother didn't tell the FBI the truth. Now, she may have been protecting you. But I have my you mean by saying I murdered a murdered a girl. I, I think that's what she was thinking that you did here. And I think no, this is bullshit. It's all bullshit. My mother wouldn't say that. Your mother did say that. She didn't. She did. The other problem is that you're given a ticket by the by the military to go sure. downtown. Right? Sure. Okay. Um, so it doesn't make any sense not to not to take the ticket. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the problem is that the ticket didn't get used. This is a key piece of discovery that helped investigators unravel McCullough's alibi. When combing through his past, they interviewed a woman named Jan Edwards, who McCullough was dating at the time of Maria Rudolph's disappearance. They asked Edwards to rifle through any and all mementos she had from the time, just in case something of use materialized. One thing she had in her possession was an old high school photo of John Tessier in a cardboard frame. Concealed within that frame was this train ticket. It is a one-way ticket from Rockford to Chicago. No way! And what way. caught the attention of investigators is that it was not punched. The reason this is so significant what? is that if John Tessier did not need a train to travel from Rockford to Chicago, then he must have had access to a different mode of transportation, i.e. his car. And if he had his car on December 3rd, it would make it much more plausible for him to have been able to perform his military-related activities during the day, while still having plenty of time to make it to Sycamore what? within the window of Maria Rudolph's abduction. Yeah, I mean, you know I can't the, believe you know they the figure that out. Is. Here's your here's your ticket to go to Rockford. Oh. Or to go from Rockford to Chicago. You never used it. 
You know where this comes from? Jan Edwards. You know how women are sentimental, they keep everything? Uh -huh. She's got pictures of you, and she said, yeah, John gave me this. That's really funny. Well, I think it's it's not funny. How's that it's, funny? It questions whether or not you were involved in this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm not involved. You can give me a lie detector test, test, I'll pass it. Okay, all right. Why don't, why don't we do that right now? All right. And that's exactly what they set to doing. Zaleski goes to get a polygraph set up, while McCullough mm. bores Agent Henley with tips about the weird kid from the neighborhood who was purported to like talking about sex. He was weird. And how do you know that? The, the, this kid told me, and I observed. Okay, okay. And so you, you, you don't you don't know that firsthand I that he's know. weird. I like what's weird. Okay, not normal. Regular viewers Shut of this up. channel will know that we don't take polygraphs seriously around here. I hate this But guy. just because the device is useless in so far as being a lie detector doesn't mean people's behavior when sitting next to it isn't sometimes interesting to observe. And Jack McCullough is a very good example of this. This is the second polygraph I've taken on this. First one was by the FBI and I passed it. We didn't what ask. Was it was uh, in 1957, I believe. Okay. And, and I'm going to pass this one as well, as long as you stay on the subject of the little girl and her murder. Well, quite frankly, Jack, there's then, some questions I know there's some questions you have to ask, ask for verification. I understand why. Well, is, actually, I'm going to ask you some questions about the details of your personal life. Yeah, and I'm some going of to them? stop answering them. This is a point of contention that will color the entirety of McCullough's polygraph exam. His stance is that he's happy to submit to a polygraph, but only on the condition that the only questions he's asked are those pertaining to the abduction of Maria Ridolf. So questions huh? pertaining to anything else, like incestuous experimentation in childhood, for instance, are out of bounds. Huh? The problem with this from a polygrapher's perspective is that this is as good as not being willing to take a test at all, as yeah. the test is supposed to work by gauging your reactions to uncomfortable questions that are not related to what you're being investigated for, and comparing those to your reactions to questions that are. Well, here, here just, just hear me out, okay? Right. Really, we're not so much interested in that, but I need to ask you some detailed personal things about your life. Some of it can be pretty sensitive, but I need them in order to structure your question. It really is in your best benefit to answer them in order for this thing to work. I, I, underst I understand you have to, you have to make, make a verification and you have to set your machine up, I understand. Um, but you read me right, my rights, mm -hmm. and my rights are I don't have to say anything if I don't want to. Right. And so but if I don't be, answer you... But it's, it's not going to be pertaining to what you're allegedly accused of. I'm going to ask you some, some questions about your personal history and so on and so forth that might make you, you know, I mean, that are a little bit sensitive. Then we're done. Well, why don't we just go ahead with the interview and see if you don't, if you don't like them. All right. Okay? All right. And what is this, this, this little girl's name? Maria Ridoff. Okay. And she was a loved little girl. This was a little Mexican girl about this high. Was the last name like, what did you say? Ridoff. Okay. It was, I think uh, the mother was Mexican, the father was... Uh, oh, Mexican. so she was uh, biracial. And yeah. They make the most beautiful kids. Oh man, she was so... She was, she was just an adorable little girl. Great, she great was. big brown eyes. And, and everybody in the neighborhood loved her. The polygraph technician, Irene Lau, would later say that whenever McCullough talked about Maria, he exhibited a degree of affection that seemed off, and this was a specific moment she cited. It's not abnormal to remark about a child being adorable, but when McCullough talks about Maria's big brown eyes, the body language he exhibits is reminiscent of someone going into some kind of trance-like state. God, so basically, that's horrifying. You're telling me that you have absolutely no knowledge of this. It's like he went absolutely. to look through a camera. You have no, no knowledge about 
Maria's abduction. I have no knowledge of her abduction other than what I was told. You did not stop and and talk and play with Maria. Oh no! She or was a child. Or Kathy. No. Well, so what? No. You know, and kids play with other kids. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was 17 years old. She was just talking. How old were you when you lost your virginity? I was 20. 20? Wow. Yeah. Who with? With why a, would, why an was older she woman down in South Carolina after I joined the Air Force. <laughs> He's Have you lying. Ever had sex with a male? Um. I haven't had sex with a male. Have you had sexual contact with a male? I, um, we're done with that. So that's a yes. I take that as a but yes. Okay, we're done. We're done. With that particular question? Yes. Okay. Um, why? Yeah, why? I mean, you really sensitive. to What's it got to do with the little girl? I'm trying to ask questions to help structure your test. It has no bearing on crimes, this, that, or the other thing. I'm trying to help you as best I can. You're not helping me. You ever been arrested before? No. You been in trouble with the law before? I had one problem with the law. What happened? This question. Oh, come on. You can tell me. I'm glad you're my friend. You think I'm going to tell these guys? Yes. Why would I do that? It's no bearing on this case. Very good, then move on. Hold on, I need to be able to structure your You don't need to do this. Next question. Have you committed any crimes that you haven't been caught for? No. Then you shouldn't have any problems with the other question, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, he's annoying. I hate him. He's Next so question. annoying. So you don't want to answer that question, even though it's the same as the other. It doesn't matter. I have a right to not answer questions. I'm not answering that question. We're trying to solve a murder. That's right, we are. Yes, we are. I'm not asking these questions for love. If you tell me yes or no and tell me truthfully, I won't go any farther than that. Can you answer truthfully, yes or no, you've never committed a crime that you haven't been caught before? Correct. Yes or no? Yes or no what was the question? Have you ever committed a crime that you haven't been caught for? No. Have I ever committed a crime I haven't been caught for? I have never committed a crime I haven't been caught for. Yes or no? I answered your question. What an idiot! You. you cannot answer it like that. It's going to be yes or no. I can't. What is your yes or no answer? Yes what? What does yes mean? This is clearly a yes, yes means, right? So saying, yes, you have to no, 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 I said, what does yes mean? I'm asking the question. Because McCullough makes it clear he will not engage with control questions, in addition to being reticent to providing straight yes or no answers that the polygraph requires, it's quite clear that whatever chart his exam yields will be even more useless than a standard polygraph test, if such a thing is even possible. Regardless, Agent Lau eventually attempts to conduct an exam in earnest. Is your correct name Jack McCullough? It is. Yes or no? Oh, yes. Okay. Do you intend to answer all of my questions truthfully? Well, I intend to answer questions truthfully. Maybe not all. I need a yes or no. Yes or no, bitch. God, I can't stand these people. So you are not going to answer all my questions truthfully? Read my, my rights again. And why do you want to take a test? If you ask a question I don't want to answer, you're not going to get an answer. But just hear me out. Just listen to the questions first, okay, before you start objecting. Okay? Do you intend to answer all of my questions truthfully? Okay. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Were you born in Belfast? Yes. Are you hoping I will make a mistake on this test? No. What is 3 plus 3 minus 2? Um, 4. Okay, don't say um, just give me one more response, okay? Mm -hmm. Have you taken any drugs, alcohol? No. Let me finish with a question. Okay? Yeah, right. Have you taken any drugs, alcohol, or medication you haven't told me about? No. Are you planning to try to manipulate this test? No. Have you researched <laughs> any information about polygraph before coming here today? 
No. I'm just going to test questions. I'm only going to ask you once, okay? But I won't go by nearly as fast as I just read it. Because after every question, I'm going to wait for a certain amount of time to last and try your reactions. Regarding whether or not you killed Maria on December 3rd, 1957, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Absolutely. Yes or yes. no? Yes. Yes or no? Okay. Jesus. Did you kill Maria? No. Let me finish reading the question. All right, sir. Did you kill Maria on December 3rd, 1957? And when I say kill Maria, that includes everything that went into this thing. I love Maria. The, I would not kill her. The abduction, the sexual assault. He said he loved the taking her. Taking her away. It is uh, disgusting. Uh, from that area, discarding her body. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm good for That's what it covers. Yeah, yeah. Okay? You understand that? Finally. Okay. So I'll ask you again. Did you kill Maria on December 3rd, 1957? No. With all the things that it entails. Correct. Abducting her, dumping her body, sexually assaulting her, killing her. No. no. Okay. On December 3rd, 1957, did you kill Maria? No. During the first 30 years of your life, do you remember ever having sexual contact with your sisters? And that means fondling, kissing, rubbing, penetration of any kind, whether it's digital or... Oh my god, he's so guilty. That just means no, no. yes. It's none of your business and it has nothing to do with Maria. It does. It doesn't. It does. Sorry. Without the ability to gauge McCullough's reaction to control questions, his responses to the relevant questions will not be analyzable. And so the polygraph is aborted, and Jack McCullough is taken back to the interrogation room. So that didn't go too good, huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's all right. Are you going to arrest me? Um, quite honestly, I haven't made a decision yet, because I've still I've got some issues with this that I can't resolve okay. without you. Okay. And um, so, you know, what I wanted to do was, you know, have you again kind of think through, because again, I, I appreciate the fact that we're talking a long time ago, okay? And... You know, if we can come up with, you know, alternatives. Okay, you haven't got shit or the FBI would have arrested me. I'm, I'm done talking to you. <gasps> that that's, makes my evening short then, yep. doesn't it? Yep. Okay. Well, is he free to go? No. Okay. <laughs> so, did, you, did you say no? I said no. Yep. Okay. You know. Yes. Did you do any research on me after you found out who I was? I don't know who you are. You know who I am. I know, I know you're, you're Mike Straczynski. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I know. I know, I'm a cold case detective, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. Detective Mike Szynski spends some time questioning McCullough, who again insists that he will not discuss anything that is not directly related to Maria Rudolph's abduction, and also continues to push the weird sex talk kid lead. You gotta realize, you know, you know, you're you're kind of like in a world of shit right now, okay? And I said you're gonna have to N give up o Omega truth, Lol. Okay. Um, to save your own ass, to be smart, okay? So just listen to me. So I'm asking, all right? Um, there's certain things that happen here that I know happen. You know what happened here. Um, once again, I'm not saying from reviewing this file, I'm not saying here that you killed that girl. Okay. I did not. I'm not saying you did, okay? That's what I'm investigating <clears throat> for, right? You're, you're, that's exactly what you've been investigating for. All right. Okay. I really think that one of the problems with what happened here is I, I believe, from reading all the reports that I did, from the interview of that other little girl who was there, okay? What I, other girl? There was two girls there. I don't know anything about a second girl. Okay, yeah, well, there were two girls out there. There were two girls out there, and they were um, playing out there when I believe that you came up there. What? Now listen to me, and then you're going to ask me the questions. And once again, I'm not saying that you killed anybody, you understand me? Oh, man. Okay. So, anyway, yeah, there was another girl there also. And that you probably did. Let me about refresh your memory. Was she kidnapped too? Uh, no. Shut she up. wasn't. How old was um, she? She was the same age. Uh, they were best friends. Oh, really? Yeah, best friends. Okay. And uh, she's still alive today, and actually, I think you met the two detectives that were here, actually, they actually another uh, yeah, detective. Yeah, yeah. They interviewed her. 
Yeah. Okay. And once again, I'm saying this is where I, I believe that you're hiding something. Okay? okay. And I'll tell you why I think you're hiding something. I'm going to tell you you're wrong right now. Okay, well, well you better hear what I say first <laughs> before you today I'm wrong, okay? okay. Uh, what I believe is going to happen here is I believe that you did go out there. And did I, not. Oh, that, that's fine. Just let me, then you can ask, right. answer my questions. So these two girls were out there. And they knew that uh, the guy, and they knew as, as Johnny. And Johnny said that he was very nice to the girl. He knew uh, Maria, and, and he offered them a piggyback ride. And I believe that what happened is that that person was you. And, oh my and, God! And, and they did did get pig back, right? But I didn't say but that girl didn't say you killed her. You understand that? McCullough again argues he has a rock solid alibi, and Szynski continues to probe for specifics that can be offered, as well as trying to get McCullough to engage in further discussion of his relationship with his family. Uh, your mom, who's deceased now. Yeah. Okay. You were real tight with her. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Like you were from once again. I called getting... my mom every every month of my life. I loved my mom to death, and my mom was, my mom was brilliant. When she died, mm -hmm. my dad uh, was asked, um, "How many people do you think are going to come to the funeral?" Mm -hmm. And dad says, "Oh, maybe thirty to forty. She gave birth to him. Imagine yeah, sure. having a kid, no, I was in the and it turns out to be uh, this you guy. Were you in Vietnam then? Um, I don't remember, don't remember where I was. Because Eileen Tissier passed in 1994, it's safe to say that McCullough was not stationed in Vietnam. His sisters have been clear that they explicitly told him he was not welcome at the funeral. Now, that little, I told you there was two little girls there, there. One girl got killed and the other little girl. She said the person, actually the person who came there who said his name was Johnny, who lived nearby, and gave him a piggyback ride. They said he was very nice, and they said he was one of these guys here, and her names, and she signed her name on the bottom of that photograph. Can you picture anybody out here that you know in this photograph? I don't know any of these guys, and I don't think any of these guys are from Sycamore. The photo third from the left is the man that Kathy Sigmund positively identified as Johnny. It is John Tessier. Jack McCullough has just claimed to not be able to recognize a photo of himself. Of himself. But he's pretending not to know any of them. I just take a look at every picture and turn it over to you. It's definitely start with one and you know, just look at it. And just... He's ignoring the third one. No. Oh. Then moves to the right away from his own photo. Touches his photo for a second before almost jumping away from it. <laughs> Hello? Dude! Oh my god! There's no way! I don't know. You know what that guy looks like? He might look like me, but I, but he's too feminine looking. That's me from a wedding picture. Obviously that was Xerox. Hmm? It's a Xerox picture. That was you. It's, it's a little whited out right there. That's you from a wedding picture that was put into this montage that the girl said was Johnny. That gave the girl the piggyback ride. Once again, she didn't say you killed him, but that's what they're saying. Number two, listen to this part. Number two, okay? Jack, look at me. Number two. Oh, okay. Jesus, chill. You know, you know why this other case got the other information we received? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is all documented, this other information that we received. You know who said that? You know who told us that you did this? Someone who I think is a pretty, from all the information I read, is a very smart person. A very intelligent person and someone who had lived with a bunch of guilt for a long time before she passed away. Yeah, you're your... going to say my mom, that's bullshit. No, no. Why, is, why do you say that's bullshit? Because she wouldn't suspect me of murder and she knew where I was. I'm telling you exactly, I'll show you the documentation that said that you did. She said that you're the one who did this and that she said she was ashamed of it. And getting back to this, this is that other little girl who said, and this is her signature right down here, once again, this is Xerox. 
That's it. Now Jack, once again, I still think you're covering for somebody. I think somebody did something there. I think you were there when this, that when the girl got killed. So he's trying to trap him in some sort of confession. I'm not saying you took the girl and killed. Yeah, at least say that he gave her a piggyback ride, so he's placed there. Came up there, and you remember this. And that's one foot through the door. Cover for somebody. And you're gonna, you, you know, I don't know who you're trying to cover for. If it's one of these other, I'm not covering for anybody, and I don't know what you're talking about. Whatever else you might want to say about Jack McCullough, he is not a stupid man, and Darn he never it. comes close to embracing the alternative question Detective Szynski attempts to put in front of him of being responsible for Maria Rudolph's piggyback ride, but not her abduction and murder. Over the course of the next half hour, Detective Szynski continues to confront McCullough with Sigmund's positive identification, his history of sex abuse allegations, his unused train ticket, and his mother's deathbed confession. But this mounting pile of circumstantial evidence will not prove to be enough for him to relent and offer a confession. Mm -hmm. It was, however, plenty for the judge that ultimately presided over his trial <gasps> on September 14th, 2012, 55 years after Maria's life was taken. Jack McCullough was convicted of the crime. He was handed a life sentence without the possibility of parole Good. for 20 years at which point he would be 93 years old. It must have been somewhat of a bittersweet moment for the living members of Maria's family and the Tessier sisters as they stood on the courthouse steps yeah, the fact that he got to fate was get away from on it one for hand, so long. The man who had tormented their minds for so long was finally being held accountable. But on the other, nothing could take back the evil things he had done or the fact that he had gotten away with it for so long. All the same, even though his being brought to justice was long overdue, Jack McCullough's case does have a silver lining to it. A message to any victim who ever feels like giving up hope, or monster who thinks they've well and truly run out the clock. Justice doesn't have an expiry date. And even if it feels like a million people have turned their back on you, that doesn't mean the next one will. Aww. Whenever you make that next phone call, or send off that next email, you never know who will be on the other end of it. It may just be that one person who will finally set things right. Wow. Wow. Wait, there's more? There's just one problem. What? Jack McCullough was totally innocent. <gasps> now bear in mind, people are seldom found innocent as opposed to not guilty. Usually, acquittals come what? down to a judge or jury determining there what? is an insufficient level of proof to justify conviction, but you can't necessarily take that as a proclamation the person on trial did not commit the crime. This is not the case with Jack McCullough. Jack McCullough positively did not murder Maria Ridolph. He couldn't have, just like he said in his interrogation. Why that is boils down to two facts. One. John Tessier placed a collect call from a post office in Rockford to Sycamore at 6.57pm on December 3rd. 2. Maria Ridolph's abduction in Sycamore is firmly established to have taken place between 6.30 and 7pm on December 3rd. Before I, I, Okay, okay, okay. Wait. A pay, place a collect call from a post office in Rockford to Sycamore at 6.57pm. Maria Rudolph's abduction in Sycamore is firmly established to have taken place between 6.30. So he was in Rockford at 6.57 p.m. when she was taken between 6.30 and 7 p.m. in Sycamore. Breaking down why these facts categorically rule John Tessier out, let's establish why they are facts, not just well-founded opinions. When the FBI initially investigated John Tessier, he mentioned the collect call when giving his alibi. The FBI did their due diligence in following up on this, and the resulting paperwork of that investigation is publicly available to this day. They spoke to the general manager of the Sycamore Ogle Telephone Company, who was able to confirm that a collect call was in fact placed by a John S. Tessier to the home of Ralph E. Tessier in Sycamore at 6.57pm, and the call was placed from the phone number 2-9297. That level of detail might seem a bit excessive, but you'll get why we're making note of it in a moment. 
Before that though, a bit of an explainer on the time frame of Maria's abduction, because there is some contention around this, even though, as you'll hopefully agree very soon, there really shouldn't be. The FBI established Maria's abduction as taking place between 6.45 and 7pm. That time frame was based off of multiple accounts from neighbours, as well as Maria's own family, most importantly her father Michael. Now granted, memory is malleable, especially in the midst of crisis, but not all memories are equal, and you can be a lot more confident in the time someone places a recent memory if they are basing that time off of a connection to something specific. Maria's brother, mother and father all told the FBI that she came into the house to get her doll after 6.30. Her father Michael said he wasn't able to place the exact time because he was preoccupied by a television show he was watching, the western series Cheyenne, which aired at 6.30. When Larry Cott was reinvestigating the case, he knew the FBI timeline, coupled with John Tessier's phone call, was a big problem, an insurmountable one in fact. We can see this in the way he bent over backward to create a new timeline that could place Maria's abduction significantly earlier than 6.30, let alone 6.45. What Cott essentially did was write off all eyewitness accounts that placed Maria's abduction in the time frame the FBI established as wrong, and then combed through interviews to find anyone who could be read as placing it earlier. One account he found was from an oil delivery man named Tom Brady, who by his estimation saw the girls playing when he was making a delivery around 6.15pm. Cott cross-referenced this with a bus driver who drove past the corner where the girls were playing at about 6.30pm oh and claimed gosh. to have not seen them. There's absolutely no reason to disbelieve the bus driver's account and the time he placed it, but it doesn't do much if anything to help move the timeline back, because the bus driver would have no reason to be keeping an eye out for two little girls playing on the yeah. street, so it's entirely plausible they were there, and he just didn't make note of them that you would put more credence in the bus driver than Maria Rudolph's own family, coupled with several other neighbours, is inexplicable, unless of course your only goal was to move the timeline to implicate McCullough. Larry Cott ultimately concluded Maria was abducted no later than 6.20pm. He also reasoned, just because McCullough could prove he placed a call from Rockford at 6.57pm, didn't he mean molested he could his prove from where within Rockford the call He's was still placed. Disgusting if person. he abducted Maria Ridolph on the street corner in Sycamore at 6.20pm, or even a little earlier, and placed the call from the outskirts of town in Rockford, he would have even more of a window to make the commute. This is another illustration of how much tunnel vision Larry Cott was operating under. Remember, it wasn't established as being merely a phone booth somewhere in Rockford. The manager at the phone company confirmed it as being from a specific number, 2-9297, and that specific number can be traced to the area in Rockford that John Tessier claimed he placed the call from at the time. With all of this in mind, let's take a look at the sort of commute we're talking about, and you should quickly get an idea of why investigators were trying to buy every minute they could to make this work. Here is a Google Maps route from the corner Maria was taken from to, to the outskirts of Rockford. So we're actually going with Larry Cott's hypothesis to start with, even though it's not credible. Now bear in mind, this is far from a precise picture of what the situation would have been in 1957, but all the differences you need to factor in add time to Tessier's best case scenario commute. The roads were different, he would have been driving in snowy conditions and using a car from the 50s. But going with this modern projection that doesn't take any of those factors into account, Google's quickest route is still a 31 minute drive covering 24 miles. So even if you allow that Maria was taken at 6.20pm, which there really is no reason to, and that John Tessier placed the call from the outskirts of town, which he didn't, and you don't take any of the variables we just mentioned into account, oh. which you absolutely should, Still, even then, the only way John Tessier's alibi doesn't still cover him in Larry Cott's scenario is that perhaps his abducting Maria Rudolph would not literally break the laws of time and space. He would have less than He's 10 still minutes guilty. to spare from the time he ran off with Maria to arriving at the phone booth. A feat that while maybe not literally impossible, is so far-fetched that it should be discounted by guilty. any reasonable person.
Then when you place Maria Rudolph's abduction where it actually was, and you put John Tessier in the actual area we know he was when he made that phone call, you still don't even need to take the roads, conditions, and car into account Miss? before you find the scenario. First of all, Ms. Alright, you stole this from Hassan. And I'm pretty sure Hassan stole this from Big... Uh, is it Bose? So, okay, listen. <clears throat> I heard you're the content-stealing king. So, you know, I don't think you really have a right to say that I stole this from you. ...is going that extra mile and breaking the laws of so. time and space. Guilty! There is simply no way it could have happened. <laughs> no, so no, no, it could have happened. Son of the jail. How did Jack still molester. get convicted? Not Miz, this guy. The FBI files were ruled inadmissible. Yeah, ain't that a hoot? Kind of hard defending yourself when the key piece of evidence exonerating you is off the table. As you would imagine, there was an appeals process and it resulted in the vacating of McCullough's conviction on April 15th of 2016, oh once the FBI files were taken into account. And a little less than a year after that, he was issued a certificate of innocence, categorically clearing his name in the eyes of the law. I mean, this would also explain why he was telling the truth during the, uh, the lie detector test. I think he was acting super weird because he didn't want to confess anything about molesting his sisters. That's why he was being super, super weird about it. But he did want to answer all the questions in relation to uh, the girl that was murdered. So maybe so, he could still run, Sorry though. for essentially lying to you for over 45 minutes. I enjoyed it. But it wasn't it was a done good time. to waste your time. It you didn't was waste to my time. illustrate a point that's always worth keeping in mind whenever you open a newspaper or turn on the television. There's always more than one way to tell a story, and the way this story was told for most of the video's duration was very much in line with how it was being told by the mainstream press while I was not everything expecting was unfolding that plot at the twist. time. And it's not as if McCullough's recorded alibi wasn't known of during that period. He and his family were screaming about it to anyone who would listen. He even explicitly made the point about the phone call during part of the interrogation we deliberately I don't think they found through. the killer. If I made a phone call from Rockford, which you've got... I know right where it's at, yeah. And at 7 o'clock, Sycamore is 30 miles away from Rockford. But just like it didn't suit the investigator's case, nor did it suit the story most of the media wanted to tell, the mm -hmm. coldest case ever solved is just a much more enticing headline than a half century later, one more dead end. No. And you can make that first headline it work was even without the facts on your side, so long as you're in charge of telling the story. Just choose what to leave in, what to leave out, what to emphasize, and what to brush over. When given subjective behavioral cues, interpret them as uncharitably as possible. Whenever something comes up that looks good, pick as many holes in it as you can. Whenever something comes up that looks bad, leave it hanging. And to be clear, there are plenty of things in this case that really did look very bad for Jack McCullough, matching Kathy Sigmund's physical description, her eventual positive identification of him, his history of sex abuse allegations, more than we even had time to get into, by the way, mm -hmm. the mysteriously unused train ticket, I the mean, creepy we have time. piggyback ride incident with Pamela Long, the strange disappearance of his adult daughter, though to be fair, there's no evidence linking him to that incident either, and his what? mother's deathbed confession, according to the account of his estranged sister who openly despises him. All of these things look bad. Terrible, in fact. And this video isn't striving to argue that Jack McCullough is a really nice guy. But he did not kill Maria Rudolph. Because no amount of things that look bad can ever trump the cold, hard constraints of reality. And it's for that reason that unfortunately, Maria Rudolph's story remains one without an ending. Oh, no way. What is this? Oh, he's just saying happy. Don't believe everything you're told. Shut up, dude. Here's your like. 